Japan. Haneda Airport, Tokyo. August the 12th, 1985. 6 p.m. Japan Airlines Flight 123 prepares for takeoff. Destination, the city of Osaka, 400 kilometers away. At the controls is First Officer Yutaka Sazaki. Keeping a close eye on him is Masami Takahama, one of JAL's most experienced training captains. Twenty-six-year-old American Ward Wallach is one of a handful of foreigners on board. My brother Ward became obsessed with Japan while he was studying as an undergraduate. Now a postgraduate student in Tokyo, Ward has embraced Japanese life despite standing out. Ward uh, dwarfed his Japanese friends. To me, he looked like Christopher Reeves. He looked like Superman. <laughs> also on board is Japanese actor and singer Q Sakamoto. I think the impression that everyone had of my husband, Q Sakamoto, was his smile. He had a big smile when he was performing on television. And he was the same at home. He loved his family. He was kind and someone who always thought of his family. Six twelve p.m. Haneda Airport Tower gives JAL one two three the all clear to take off. Weather conditions are fine. The crew expect a short routine flight. The Boeing 747 begins climbing to its cruising altitude of 24,000 feet. p.m. Two explosions rock the plane. Something exploded. The gear door. Check the gears. The aircraft's flight controls don't respond. The crew desperately try to figure out what's happened. <laughs> Cabin pressure drops. Attention. Emergency descent. Put the mask over your face. Fasten your seatbelt. Put out your cigarettes. This is an emergency descent. 6.25 p.m. JAL-123 is now out of control. Captain Takahama declares an emergency. Tokyo Japan-123 requests it back to Haneda. Descend and radios over. Tokyo air traffic control. Take a magnetic course of 90 degrees for radar vector to Oshima. The crew is trying to wrestle the 747 into making a right turn to follow a course back to Haneda Airport. Going to right, turn over. But the plane 
is not responding. Yes, sir. I said don't bang that mug. Yes, sir. What's going on? Tokyo Air Traffic Control radios JAL 123. Uh, Japan 123, please confirm you have an emergency. That's affirmative. What is the nature of your emergency? Japan A123, fly heading 090, radar vector to Oshima. The plane appears to be heading away from Tokyo Haneda Airport. Japan A123, what you understood? Uh. Japan A123, uncontrollable. Tokyo Control suggests heading for the closer Nagoya Airport, 133 kilometers away. Your position is 72 miles to Nagoya. Can you land in Nagoya? No, negative. Request back to Haneda. The crew want to aim for the longer runway at Tokyo's Haneda Airport. The aircraft is still above 20,000 feet. Passengers are struggling to breathe. There's damage at the back. I don't know what to do. People can't breathe. Captain, the oxygen mask in five right failed. I think we better descend. Hi. Pilots attempt to lower the plane's altitude to increase the cabin's oxygen levels. No stone! No stone! Yes, sir! No stone! Use both hands! Both hands! Yes. 6.38 p.m. Yes, How about putting the gear down? To create drag and slow down the 747, the crew drop its landing gear. But a controlled descent is proving impossible. Tokyo Air Traffic Control follows the plane on radar. Over the next three minutes, the aircraft does a complete 360 degree turn, losing altitude all the time. Uh, can you control the aircraft now? Japan Air 123, uncontrollable. Uh, Japan Air 123, Roger, understood. Would you like to contact Haneda? Keep it at least. This may be hopeless. At Yokota, a nearby US military airbase, emergency crews are standing by. Down. 6.47 p.m. The plane has dropped to 7,000 feet. But with little control over its heading, the pilots now face new dangers. Hey, there's a mountain ahead! JAL-123 is now miles off course, deep in the mountainous region northwest of Tokyo. Turn right! There's a mountain there! Take control to the right! Right turn! Right turn, that's right! We could hit the mountain! Yes, I know! The crew battled to lift right the aircraft turn. out of danger. Left turn! Put the power on! Left turn now! Left turn! Oh. 
power! More power! Max power! 6.53 p.m. The pilots wrestle the plane up to 13,400 feet. But it's still 65 kilometers northwest of Tokyo Airport. All air traffic control can do is watch. Uh, we are ready for your approach at any time and uh, coordinating with Yukta. Yukta available for landing also. Power stop! Flappy now! On board, the plane pitches forward and starts an uncontrolled dive. Japan Air 123, do you read? Japan Airline 123, do you read? The plane disappears from radar. Do you read? The wreckage of a jumbo jet can be seen scattered across the mountains. A specially configured 747 loaded with more than 500 people at the peak of one of Japan's most popular travel holidays. And no signs of survivors. I knew from the breaking news that a plane had disappeared from the radar. But I had no idea if my husband was on that plane or not. I can't remember how much later it was when we were able to read out the passenger list, when it was announced on television. When I heard it, I knew for certain he was on that flight. How can I put it? I was aghast. Just 18 minutes after the plane disappears, a U.S. Air Force C-130 locates the wreckage on a ridge of Mount Ostaka, 100 kilometers northwest of Tokyo. It radios the Japanese authorities with coordinates. The U.S. offers military assistance. The Japanese decide to go it alone and set in motion their own rescue mission. In charge are the Japanese self-defense forces. Yoshihisa Masuda is stationed at a military base in Chiba Prefecture, close to where the plane crashed. It was just as I returned to headquarters after my summer leave. The base was in uproar. I asked a colleague what was going on, and I was told that the whereabouts of a JAL flight were unknown. The night the plane crashed, the base was put on standby, and people were saying that we were probably going to go out. A Japanese helicopter sent out reports no sign of survivors. The mountain terrain and lack of equipment for nighttime operations slows any larger Japanese rescue effort. It doesn't reach the site until 14 hours after the crash. Miraculously, four survivors are found despite spending a night on the mountainside. But 520 people are dead, including Q Sakamoto and Ward Wallach. I think when I first heard he was on the plane, there was a, an air of unreality. I mean, Ward was vibrant, he was young, uh, it's not supposed to happen that way. Uh, it was unreal.
Shortly after the crash, survivors recall hearing the screams of passengers in the wreckage dying out during the night. Physicians at the scene note some of the injuries they found would not have been fatal if help had arrived sooner. Of course, I found out afterwards that rescue operations were not carried out at the site straight away on the day. But they should have gone straight away. Why? Why did they take their time? Now, by rewinding the events and going deep into the official investigation, we can reveal what lay behind the deadliest single air accident in aviation history. The Japanese Aircraft Accident Investigation Committee is responsible for investigating the crash. As demanded by Japanese law, alongside this is a criminal investigation run by the police. In the United States, the manufacturer of the 747, Boeing, is alerted to the disaster in Japan. John Purvis was a member of Boeing's air safety investigation team in 1985. When we learned about this airplane and realized it was a 747, we were concerned, along with everybody, that this accident could uh, really tarnish the uh, reputation of the airplane because at the time it was the largest commercial jet flying. With the lives of millions of 747 passengers at risk, the United States National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, want answers to why this American-built plane crashed. NTSB representative Ron Schleed is assigned to investigate. There was an extreme concern that if there is a mechanical problem, that it could be a generic flaw and that could affect the entire fleet. An investigation team of Boeing engineers and members of NTSB heads for Japan. But once there, gaining access to the site proves difficult. When we arrived in Tokyo and got to the hotel and first met the Japanese, it was clear there was some problems in getting access to the information that was known and to the accident site eventually. As the plane's manufacturer, Boeing has an internationally agreed obligation to investigate the crash to make sure all other 747s are airworthy. However, because this flight, uh, Japan 123, was a domestic flight, the international rules did not apply in 1985. Therefore, we did not have an automatic right to go we had to request permission to travel and to uh, work with the Japanese. Whilst the Americans wait for police permission to access the crash site, Japanese air accident investigators share with them JAL 123's cockpit voice recordings. We could hear an explosion on the voice recorder. In fact, there were two loud explosions, one right after the other. Survivors confirm there was an explosion at the back of the plane leading investigators to a chilling conclusion. Worldwide in the 1980s, there had been several terrorist acts, hijackings and bombings of airplanes. Uh, so when this accident occurred, it gave us a strong suspicion that it was an act of terrorism.
we were very highly suspicious that this was a bomb. Further evidence of a possible bomb detonation comes to light in Sagami Bay, 153 kilometers south of the crash site. Japanese sailors discover a large piece of the plane. One of the early things we were shown was the vertical fin or the tail of the airplane, which had come off over water south of uh, Tokyo, right under the flight path of the airplane. And it indicated that the airplane had had a catastrophic problem uh, well before they ever got to the accident site. A photograph taken during the last minutes of JAL 123's flight confirms investigators' fears. It clearly shows the tail fin is missing. It was, you know, very clear that something unusual had happened. And again, this added to our conjecture that this could have been a bomb. Five days after their arrival, the American investigation team is granted permission by the Japanese police to access the crash site. Makeshift helipads mean helicopters can now land on the remote mountain ridge of Mount Ostaka, north of Mount Fuji. It was chaotic at the top. Helicopters coming and going and coming and going continuously. The investigators begin searching amongst the wreckage for JAL 123's major structural components. One of the things you do as an investigator is you first look for the what we call the four corners of the airplane. Where's the nose? Where are the wingtips? Where's the tail? A few meters down the ridge, they find remains of the aft pressure bulkhead, or APB. This circular structure is made of a series of overlapping metal plates riveted together. Sitting between the cabin and tail section, it's designed to stop pressurized cabin air escaping through the back of the aircraft. When we first saw the bulkhead, it was, of course, torn up and badly damaged into many pieces, six or eight or 10 major ones and some little ones. And the pieces were kind of triangular shaped. They ran from the center of the bulkhead out to the edge, something like a chunk of an umbrella. The investigators study the APB for the telltale signs of bomb damage. A bomb leaves very distinctive evidence on the metal when it explodes. It has so much energy, it's more energy than you can generate in an actual aircraft crash. But most of the bulkhead wreckage displays damage consistent with a high-speed impact. One of the general observations when metal is ripped apart, it'll leave a distinctive, what I call a sawtooth shape of a fracture. And it's just ripped apart. We saw evidence of that in the aft part of the aircraft and in most of the aft pressure bulkhead debris. It certainly wasn't caused by a bomb. Looking closer, they discover some unusual damage. There was one piece of the bulkhead that showed curious characteristics different than the rest of the wreckage from the bulkhead. In one area, two pieces had separated in a very straight line, as opposed to the rest of the bulkhead, which had been torn and ripped in overload. It just separated or failed differently, and I wanted to know why. The team want to examine the bulkhead section in their lab, but the police refuse permission, as their investigation to establish whether a criminal act is responsible for the crash is still ongoing. Because in Japan, the uh, criminal investigation takes precedence over a safety investigation, 
This caused uh, difficulty for the safety team to gain access to the accident site, to gain access to other data, including the wreckage that fell off the airplane. It, it complicated and delayed some of the safety investigation because the criminal investigators were in charge. The team invent an ingenious way around the problem. Boeing came up with a uh, procedure to take replicas of the fracture surfaces, essentially a um, tape, like adhesive tape, that they would put on the fracture surface. It would not damage the fracture surface. It would take a mirror image of, of replica of the fracture, and then that could be examined in a laboratory. The investigators examined tape imprints and field sketches taken from the bulkhead section, displaying the unusual damage. It appears one bulkhead plate has sheared off along the line of rivets, joining it to its neighbor. This metal had torn through these holes. I thought I had detected fatigue and what we were seeing on the bulkhead was our eureka moment. It was the golden bullet. Having detected the telltale signs of metal fatigue, the investigators now need to know what caused it. They must also find out whether this is an isolated incident or a problem that could ground over 600 747s in service at the time. The investigators pore over the plane's history. In it, they discover that the plane had once been involved in an unusual accident. They learn that in 1978, at Osaka Airport, the plane's pilot landed with the nose too high. The tail struck the ground and scraped along the runway. The aft pressure bulkhead was damaged and needed repairing. It had been repaired seven years earlier and it became very, very critical to the investigation, very interesting to us. Discovering the fact that the airplane had had a repair uh, was a huge turning point in the investigation. Boeing HQ in Seattle faxed the repair report to the investigative team in Japan. When uh, the airplane had been damaged and the repair crew looked at the airplane, it was clear they were going to have to replace the um, bulkhead. They elected, I think, to replace just the lower half because of shipping problems with the whole bulkhead. The Boeing engineers designed a repair. They made a drawing and written instructions on how to put the uh, bulkhead back together. The 1978 repair design instructs Boeing engineers to attach the new lower half of the bulkhead to the existing top half. To join them together, they're secured with a splice plate held in place with three rows of rivets. As the unusual metal fracture sheared off along the line of rivets, the investigator's suspicion falls on the join between the splice and the bulkhead's two halves. The team calculates what would happen if the repair used fewer rivets than required. One of the uh, scenarios we considered during our discussions was what if the repair to the bulkhead was done improperly one of the team members did in a mathematical calculation, if that were true, and it determined that the bulkhead would fail at about 11,000 cycles. Remarkably, the plane had performed 12,319 takeoff and landing cycles since the repair, very close to the predicted number. It's a breakthrough moment. Multi bulkhead repair could be behind the world's deadliest single aircraft crash. The investigators now need hard evidence to back up their theory. Japanese police again grant access to the crash site, so the team can examine the wreckage in more detail. 
So we went right to the area of the pressure bulkhead that had what I considered a curious looking uh, fracture. We discovered that the repair had not been done as designed. In the process, they had had a place where they had to put in um, the splice plate and it had been done wrong. The investigators discover the splice plate from the wreckage is an incorrect size. It appears that to make it fit, the engineers deviated from the repair design. The splice plate, in fact, had been cut into two pieces. The narrower section was fixed with a single row of rivets. The wider section of the splice was fixed with a double row. That rendered that section of the splice basically to 70% uh, strength of what it would have been otherwise. Because of the faulty repair, just one row of rivets takes most of the force during every takeoff and landing pressure cycle. During each cycle, the bulkhead stretches and shrinks like the skin of a balloon. Tiny cracks form and grow around where the rivets punch through the metal. Some 12,000 cycles after the repair, the splice plate shatters. High pressure air from the cabin bursts through the hole, weakening the bulkhead, causing it to fail explosively. This failure is heard as the first explosion as high pressure air from the passenger cabin bursts through the bulkhead. Investigators now want to know the reason for the second explosion. Following the discovery of wreckage in Sagami Bay, they know that JAL-123 lost its tail fin 12 minutes into the flight. Revisiting the flight recorder, they realize this is around the same time that both explosions are heard, leading the team to an astonishing conclusion. As high pressure air bursts through the failed bulkhead into the tail section, it blows the tail fin clean off. During the design of the 747, we didn't anticipate a vertical fin or coming off or a vertical or a pressure bulkhead blowing out. And it just wasn't something that was anticipated to happen. The investigators must now find out how an exploding bulkhead and lost tail fin led to the pilots losing control and the plane crashing. Air traffic control tracked JAL-123, meandering deep into the Kanto mountain range, away from Haneda Airport in Tokyo, and recorded the plane repeatedly losing and then gaining altitude. Through plotting the plane's flight path, the investigators recognize a familiar pattern, a type of aircraft motion called a fugoid. As JAL-123 begins to dive, it accelerates. The increased speed generates lift, and as the plane climbs, it slows, causing it to dip again. The investigators know this fugoid motion is indicative of an aircraft with inoperable control surfaces. These are critical for banking and controlling the plane's altitude. The rudder, attached to the tail fin, controls yaw, the angle at which the plane flies forward through the air. Loss of a rudder alone will not lead to fugoid motion, but major damage to a plane's hydraulic system will. Large uh, modern airliners, uh, all the flight controls are boosted by hydraulic pressure. There's no way the pilot has enough strength 
to move the uh, uh, flight controls through cables and pulleys like in the old days. So the hydraulic systems power the flight controls. The team realized JAL-123's hydraulics were critically damaged during the bulkhead's explosion. To get the four hydraulic systems up into the vertical fin and to the rudders, all four have to go up there. And that means they have to run through the pressure bulkhead to start with, and they have to run up into the vertical fin. As the tail fin rips off, it severs critical hydraulic lines. The aircraft is paralyzed. Once they lost the vertical fin and the hydraulic systems, the pilots uh, were only able to minimally control the airplane with engine power. The airplane continued to fly in circles, up and down, virtually out of control. This explains why the plane flies in a fugoid motion. Why the crew have extreme difficulty controlling the plane's descent. And why it cannot turn back to Haneda Airport and instead descends deep into the Kanto mountain range. The crew's only option is to ride the throttle, trying to maneuver the plane by powering each of the engines separately. At the mercy of their stricken aircraft, there is nothing the pilots can do. A crash is inevitable. Having delved deep into the investigation, we can now reveal the events that caused the worst single aircraft accident in aviation history. June the 2nd, 1978. Seven years to disaster. A JAL Boeing 747's aft pressure bulkhead is incorrectly repaired following a tail strike incident leaving it critically weakened. 6.12 p.m., August the 12th, 1985. 44 minutes to disaster. The same JAL plane takes off from Haneda Airport, Tokyo. As the cabin pressurizes, tiny cracks on the repaired bulkhead begin to grow. Thirty-two minutes to disaster. The bulkhead explodes. Pressurized air blasts into the plane's tail section ripping off the tail fin and severing the hydraulic lines. 31 minutes to disaster. Captain Takahama declares an emergency. The pilots fight to control the aircraft, unaware that their basic flight controls are permanently disabled. The plane climbs and dips. The pilots struggle to maneuver with engine thrust alone. Eight minutes to disaster. Right. The pilots guide the plane down Take to 7,000 feet. Right. But it's now in the heart of the Kanto mountain up, range. 6.56 p.m. Seconds Fly. to disaster. Oh, ah. Oh, ah. But the tragedy isn't over. Testimony from one survivor reveals that others also survived the impact. Twenty-four minutes after disaster. An American Air Force C-130 finds the crash site and reports its location to Japanese authorities. A 
hovering Marine Corps helicopter offers to drop two men onto the mountain. But just a minute later, an order comes through demanding they return to base. 9 a.m., 14 hours after disaster, the first Japanese rescuers arrive on foot at the crash site. How many more passengers could have survived if U.S. forces had been allowed to land becomes a focal point for bereaved relatives. To this day, there is no clear understanding as to who declined U.S. help. No one in the Japanese Self-Defense Force admits to ordering the U.S. crew to stand down. But in response to the crash and subsequent fallout, the Japanese Self-Defense Forces did purchase helicopters and equipment designed for nighttime operations in mountainous terrain. The disaster also has profound ramifications for Japan's air industry. JAL President Yasumoto Tagaki resigns shortly after the accident. The JAL maintenance manager commits suicide. A terrible price had been paid, and now lessons had to be learned. One of the things I got out of this accident uh, investigation was that uh, the accident really was preventable if the engineering work on the repair seven years before the accident had been scrutinized a little more carefully uh, and done properly, the accident wouldn't have occurred. Boeing confirmed an incorrect repair caused the failure of JAL-123's bulkhead. The company changed their procedures, so significant repairs are scrutinized before implementation and afterwards by a second pair of eyes. Regular checks are made to detect any signs of metal fatigue. To reduce the vulnerability of the 747's hydraulics, a valve was added to the line controlling two of the plane's elevators and the lower rudder. If this line is severed, some control should still be possible. I think this accident taught the aviation industry a lot of lessons, things about airplane design and maintenance. It was really an important step in improving aviation safety around the world. JAL admitted no liability for the crash, but offered to pay compensation. 90% of the victim's relatives settled with the airline without going to court. But neither the compensation nor the improvements to safety offered much comfort to the bereaved relatives. There was a sense uh, among, I think, all the victims, but, but certainly in my family, uh, that this was, um, this was wrong. That what happened was avoidable, uh, that it didn't need to happen.